Hello uh, and welcome everybody. I'm Zainab Badawi. I am chair of the Royal African Society and welcome to this um, annual lecture. Let me just say a couple of sentences about the Royal African Society. Welcome to our friends who know us, our old friends, but also perhaps some newcomers. And um, you know, the Royal African Society is a wonderful institution. We turn 120 next year. So we're all looking forward to um, that landmark uh, year. And we promote um, a better understanding and appreciation and enjoyment of Africa in all its uh, manifestations, be it business, politics, culture, economics, and all the rest of it. And um, we have a lively set of programs during um, the year. Obviously, because of the pandemic, they've had to be um, virtual such as this uh, annual lecture. But, you know, we've just finished a wonderful um, film festival that was a real showcase of African talent. If you haven't visited African Arguments, our, our very, very important and engaging um, website, which tells you everything you need to know about Africa and things that you didn't even know you didn't know about Africa, it's an absolute must read. And um, this annual lecture is one of the highlights of the Royal African Society. Um, and we are so happy this year that we've got a really standout person who's going to be delivering the lecture for us. And it is Ambassador Johnny Carson, who joins us from the United States. Hello to you, um, Johnny. So, Johnny, I know you're going to be talking about um, Africa and the United States, past, present and future, and touching, of course, on the, um, the Black Lives Matter and just what we might expect um, from the new Biden administration. And um, so, uh, but before we do that, I just want to um, really tell uh, or remind people about your stellar um, career, because of course you've had a very, very long experience in the um, US State Department. And um, as we speak, I'm going to see if we can see some photographs um, of you, because of course you were Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, during the um, first Obama administration. And there you are with um, the former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kawunda, who is 96 years old. And um, I think we just have to pause for a moment there, um, Johnny, and just say, you know, tell us, tell us a little something about your meeting with Kenneth Kawunda. Well, let me say that it is, uh, a, was a remarkable opportunity to talk to one of the wise uh, African uh, leaders. Uh, and I was in Zambia actually to meet with the then uh, president of the uh, country, but took an opportunity to uh, have uh, lunch with uh, Kenneth Kaunda. Uh, I was fascinated uh, not only by his wisdom, but also by his hidden talents. Uh, he saw a piano in the home of the US uh, ambassador at the time, Mark Storella, and uh, President Kaunda uh, turned out to be a great pianist <laughs> and also a great singer. And uh, in addition to all of his political skills and talents, uh, he had a marvelous voice and really had a golden hands at the piano. Yeah, you know what, Johnny, I can testify to testify to that myself personally, because I can honestly say I've been serenaded by Kenneth Kaunda. <laughs> he sang to me playing the guitar this time. So absolutely, he's a very, very musical man. So yeah, wonderful. So we'll carry on looking at some pictures as, as, as I um, tell people about your career. There you are with Ola Shagan Obasanjo, former president of Nigeria, because now, Johnny, and we can roll on with the pictures, um, now, Johnny, you you are um, a senior advisor at the US Institute of Peace and also at the Albright Stonebridge um, Group. Um, as I said, you were Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs during the first Obama presidency. You've been a diplomat um, over your stellar career. Oh, there you are with Colin Powell and Susan Rice. Um, and you've served in London, in Lagos, your ambassador in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, Uganda. Uh, you've been all over the place. Uh, you studied at Drake University in Iowa. Oh, I'm just gonna pause here because there you are with Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's just been um, named as President-elect Joe Biden's 
ambassador to the United Nations. And I know you're going to talk about her in your uh, presentation, but there you are with her. And of course, with uh, the wonderful Edward Perkins, a, a veteran um, ambassador in the United States who, who served, I think, as ambassador in the United Nations. Anyway, you also studied at SOAS here in the, um, at London University and um, you are a member of the American Academy of Diplomacy and the National De De Democracy Institute. I could go on and on, but one very important post, of course, is that you are chair of the International Advisory Council for Afrobarometer. So um, I know you, you know, you've carried on doing amazing things in so many ways, and um, we really look forward to listening to what you have to say. But just before you start your lecture, um, Johnny, you, you, do you know Joe Biden himself, the, the president-elect? I have met the uh, president-elect, and I had an opportunity in uh, June of 2010 to accompany him on his trip to Kenya and South Africa. Uh, so I have uh, been in his company before and have uh, also had the pleasure of taking a few African visitors uh, to the White House to meet him. Right. OK. And we, we've seen some of his eye catching appointments and his all women communications team. And of course, his African-American vice president, Senator Kamala Harris. So. Ambassador Johnny Carson, the floor is now all yours. Please do share with us your um, insights and deliver this year's annual lecture of the Royal African Society, Africa and the United States, past, present and future. Thank you. Zineb, thank you very, very much for that very kind and warm uh, introduction. And thank you again for inviting me to address the members of the Royal Africa Society. I am extremely pleased to be with you, even if it is only virtually. Having studied at SOAS uh, in downtown London several decades ago, uh, I am aware of the rich history of the Royal Africa Society, its publications, its scholarship, and its eminent uh, members. The Royal Africa Society as you have said, is one of the world's most distinguished organizations devoted to fostering a better understanding of Africa and committed to building stronger relations between Africa and the United Kingdom. That work and tradition continues. And I'm proud to be here with you uh, this evening. Although I am affiliated, as you said, with a number of organizations in the United States, the views I express uh, today uh, are entirely uh, my own. These are extraordinary times in the history of the United States and also in America's relations with Africa. The United States has just gone through a contentious and historic presidential election. And while that election was a uniquely American process, the outcome has global implications. Who we elect and what we do as a nation has an impact on Africa. The last four years are a demonstration of that. Africa is also at a critical point in its own history as countries across the continent face a mounting array of new and old challenges while struggling to become more relevant and significant as players in the international political and economic arena. This may be an inflection point in US relations with the continent and in the continent's relations with the United States. As we enter the last month of 2020 with the US elections behind us, this is in fact a good moment to stop and reflect on US-Africa relations and what the future may hold for Washington's interaction with the 54 states of the continent, collectively and individually. It is also equally or even more important to look at Africa's challenges, five of which will define 
Africa's progress over the next three or four decades. How it deals with those challenges will probably have a greater impact on Africa's future than its relations with the United States or any other major global power. Africa's destiny and Africa's future are really in the hands of Africa's leaders and its people. This is probably truer today than at any other time in the past. America's foreign policy always begins at home and is a reflection of our own domestic values and principles. So it is true when we stumble at home, we can often stumble abroad. So let me start by saying something about the United States. The last four years have been enormously difficult for Americans as we have witnessed an unprecedented domestic assault on our own democratic institutions and norms. And 2020 will be remembered for the multiple challenges the United States has experienced. The failure to contain the COVID-19 pandemic the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, and the social and racial unrest unleashed by the brutal death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. These events have shaken America, tarnished its self-image, and exposed the deep historical divisions in our own society. The racial unrest, the police excesses, and the Black Lives Matter movement have had the double impact of exposing the still festering wounds in America's social fabric while generating social justice, reverberations, and waves across the globe that have inspired young people to stand up and fight against social, racial, and historical injustices in their own countries. The last four years have also been a low point in U.S. relations with Africa, reversing the steady improvement which followed the end of the Cold War. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, U.S. policy in Africa under both Republican and Democratic administrations changed quite dramatically. Washington no longer viewed Africa as a pawn on the chessboard in the struggle between the East and the West. Politically, Washington began to advocate for multi-party rule, stronger democratic institutions, and greater respect for human rights. Economically, the United States stepped up its call for African countries to implement meaningful market-based reforms and launched a series of development initiatives designed to spur greater economic and trade relations. African nations responded to the global changes as well and initiated their own democratic and economic reforms. Across the continent, governments adopted multi-party constitutions, established term limits for presidents, and held regular elections. The economic reforms were equally impressive. Encouraged by these changes and recognizing the continent's growing importance, successive democratic and republic administrations in Washington embraced Africa. The Clinton administration increased foreign assistance and established the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which opened the American market to free trade from virtually every African country. The Bush administration, a Republican administration, established PEPFAR, the president's emergency plan to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS, as well as the Millennium Challenge Corporation to provide major infrastructure grants. And the Obama administration 
went even further, launching Power Africa to speed up electrification around the continent, Feed the Future to help generate a green agricultural revolution in Africa, and YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative, to bring hundreds of young, talented, and creative African professionals to the United States to bolster their entrepreneurial, management, and technical skills. Washington also collaborated with African countries to deal with a host of transnational issues, including terrorism in Somalia and Sahel, major health pandemics in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, narco trafficking in West Africa, and piracy in the Red Sea. By January of 2017, after eight years in office, President Obama had elevated Africa as a priority and had undertaken several new high-profile public initiatives involving African leaders. President Obama invited 50 African heads of state to Washington for the first ever U.S.-African summit to discuss major political, economic, and trade issues. The Obama administration also advocated for the regular inclusion of Nigeria and South Africa in G20 meetings and other high-level international deliberations and gatherings. When President Obama walked out of the White House on January 20, 2017, Africa's standing in Washington had never been higher. And there was a feeling, a very strong feeling that relations were moving in the right direction. The Trump administration changed that overnight. Over the last four years, President Trump's policies have uprooted and unraveled U.S. foreign policy around the globe. The administration's global policies, as well as those focused on Africa, have had a negative global impact. They have exhibited a contempt and sometimes callous disregard for Africa that has stirred a level of distrust and weakened American influence in some African capitals. President Trump's widely reported vulgar remarks about African countries probably reflects his personal disdain and disregard for Africa. While the Trump administration has left in place a number of the major African development and trade programs of its predecessors and has oft proclaimed that Africa's stability, prosperity, and security are in America's national security interests. Many of President Trump's America first policies have often demonstrated a strong African and strong anti-African and strong anti-Muslim bias. This is particularly true of the Trump administration's aggressive anti-immigration policies. In his first week in office, President Trump signed an executive order banning foreign nationals of seven predominantly Muslim countries from visiting the United States. Three of those countries, Sudan, Somalia, and Libya, were on the first list, and a fourth, Chad, was added later. Although two of the African countries were subsequently removed from the list, the Trump administration has implemented a number of other new visa and immigration restrictions. Some of these discriminatory measures were aimed specifically at, Niger at Africa, a few specifically at Nigeria. Over the past four years, the administration has sharply reduced legal immigration from Africa. Earlier this year, the Trump administration restricted immigrate, immigrant visas admissions from Nigeria and recently proposed that Nigeria nationals be excluded from the next cycle of the international visa lottery program. Heavier 
Restrictions have also been placed on citizens from Sudan and Tanzania seeking permanent resident status in the United States. The Trump administration's hostility toward multilateral organizations has also impacted Africa. The decision to pull out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the announced withdrawal from the World Health Organization, and the voluntary departure from the UN Human Rights Council have all negatively impacted Africa in one way or another. The U.S. withdrawal from the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement eliminated America's $2 billion contribution to the Green Climate Fund. A significant portion of that money would have gone to Africa to build resilience against climate shocks. The U.S. withdrawal from the World Health Organization is also a blow to Africa at a time when the international community is dealing with a major global pandemic. The World Health Organization provides critical support for healthcare services and African nations depend more on the WHO than any other region of the world. And for some Africans, the Trump administration's recent condemnation of the WHO was also seen as a professional attack on one of Africa's highest ranking and most respected international civil servants, Dr. Tedros Gabriesus, the director of WHO. Various administrations have expressed frustration with the work of the UN Human Rights Council, but the Trump administration's decision to pull out of that organization deprives the US of a voice at the table to encourage greater respect for human rights and to investigate governments that abuse their citizens. The absence of the United States increases the opportunity for wrongdoers to escape scrutiny and sanction, including those countries in Africa where human rights violations are occurring. Advancing democracy and governance has also been a core element of US policy since the end of the Cold War. However, the Trump administration has retreated from democracy promotion in Africa, just as in other parts of the world. Funding for democracy programs administered by the State Department and USAID have come under attack from the White House as it has sought to reduce the budgets of the State Department and USAID. Vigorous State Department demarches supporting democratic reforms have started to dry up. The administration has remained silent or taken a bureaucratically timid approach towards fraud fraudulent elections, democratic abuses, and the closing of political space in a number of African countries. It has also shown an unwillingness to speak out consistently and publicly against democratic abuses. President Trump's statements attacking press freedom and judicial institutions and praising strong men has made it easier for authoritarian leaders globally and in Africa to criticize America's own political shortcomings, to brush aside American demarches on democracy, elections, and human rights, and to carry on abusing their power and their people, knowing full well that they will not be seriously challenged about their repressive policies. Probably the most disturbing aspect of Trump's policies over the last four years towards Africa has been the reintroduction of the theme of great power competition across the continent. Almost in a throwback to the 1970s and 80s, the Trump administration has made China a central feature in its policy towards Africa. In a major speech in December 2018, 
former National Security Advisor John Bolton, using language reminiscent of the Cold War, asserted that the greatest threat to Africa's progress and success was, and I quote, not poverty or Islamic extremism, but an expansionist China, unquote. He accused China of using its economic and commercial policies in the country's Belt and Road Initiative to, quote, gain competitive advantage over the United States, unquote, and to, quote, hold states in Africa captive to Beijing's wishes, unquote. The Trump administration's efforts to throw Africa into the middle of America's complex relations with China diminishes Africa's intrinsic importance, does little to advance U.S. interests across the continent, and throws the United States into an unhelpful competition about who is doing the most for Africa on any given day, month, or year. As President Trump, pre Trump prepares to leave office, President-elect Biden's victory on November 3 is probably good news for Africa. Although I have no particular insight or inside information, I think that President-elect Biden will reverse Trump's negative policies towards Africa and actively seek to restore and rebuild America's standing across the continent. Africa will probably find Biden to be an enthusiastic partner, looking for opportunities to work closely with leaders to revitalize and rebuild the current frayed relationships. The first step in this process has already started. President-elect Biden has nominated an experienced team of senior foreign policy experts, all of whom have traveled across Africa. And his nominee for U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, is one of Washington's top Africa experts having previously run the State Department's Africa Bureau and having served as the U.S. Ambassador with distinction in Liberia. She is well known and well liked in Africa's capitals. Although she will be based in New York, I suspect she will use her position at the United Nations and her seat in the Biden cabinet to be a strong and continuous advocate for African engagement. When it takes office in mid-January, I think the Biden administration will end many of the Trump administration's global policies that have negatively impacted the continent. President-elect Biden has promised to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement and he has selected former Secretary of State John Kerry to be his special envoy on climate issues. Secretary Kerry knows Africa as well. Biden will also stop America's withdrawal from the World Health Organization, continue its support for the WTO, and look for ways to re-engage on global human rights issues at the United States, in the United Nations, and in other international fora. In all likelihood, the Biden team will abandon the global gag rule that prohibits, U prohibits U.S. funding for certain health care organizations. It is useful to remember that as a senator and as vice president, President-elect Biden voted for and supported many of the important bipartisan development assistance programs that underpin and provide the foundation for America's engagement in Africa. His administration is almost certain to reaffirm strong support for PEPFAR, 
Power Africa, MCC, and Feed the Future. While foreign assistance will receive renewed focus, the Biden administration will likely utilize the new International Development Finance Corporation to bolster U.S. investment and commercial ties with Africa. And with the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, set to expire in 2025, the administration will probably turn its attention to developing a new trade agreement with Africa, one that will take into account the positive progress Africa has made with its own continental free trade agreement. But the centerpiece of Washington's re-engagement will probably be another major White House summit with African leaders, similar to the one that President Obama held in 2014. The rebuilding process will not stop there. And in line with President-elect Biden's domestic slogan of build back better, I fully expect the new administration will unravel uh, a new set of Africa-specific initiatives that may focus on youth, women, climate change, and the expansion of digital technology, literacy, and business innovation. I would expect former Secretary of State John Kerry will include Africa in his climate change agenda. And I anticipate expanded outreach to the African Union, as well as efforts at closer ties to key states like South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Ghana. Despite the negative impact that Trump has had on America's democracy and international image, the Biden administration will place renewed emphasis on the values of democracy, good governance, and the rule of law. The president-elect has promised to host a democracy summit in his first year in office. Overseas, the administration will take a renewed interest in supporting democratic advancement, respect for human rights and civil liberties. The Biden administration will probably support the democracy promotion work more strongly of the National Endowment for Democracy, the National Democratic Institute, and the National Republican Institute. And I suspect he will speak out clearly and loudly in favor of free, fair, and transparent elections, term limits for executives, and the promotion and protection of democratic institutions and open space for civil society groups to operate. The Biden administration will probably abandon the Trumpian view that sees Africa as a battleground in a new Cold War with China. While Washington will no doubt continue to urge African nations to avoid falling into a new debt trap and to manage carefully its business and financial relations with China in a careful and transparent manner, it will not measure the strength of U.S. ties with Africa based on some arcane calculus of what China may or may not be doing across the continent. The U.S. will seek to build its relations with Africa based on the continent's intrinsic economic, political, and security importance to the United States, and not as a part of its element of its elementary relations with China. The Biden administration, in my estimation, is likely to recognize that most African states value relations with both Washington and Beijing and do not want to be caught in the middle of a big power rivalry, a point that has been underscored by some of the polling that has been done and the remarks of some presidents. Despite their differences, when looking at Africa, 
the United States and China do share some goals in common. They seek stability in Africa, economic development, and the need to combat climate change and health pandemics. Those are major transnational issues that are of concern to the United States. They're of concern to Africa and China as well. And I expect that there may be space for some trilateral cooperation to expand in areas where there are mutual concerns among all three to the benefit of Africa, the United States, China, and even the global community. Despite what I think will be the Biden administration's strong re-engagement in Africa, as I said earlier, Africa's future is really in the hands of Africans. 60 years after most African states achieved their independence, most African leaders know what is required to move their countries forward politically and economically. They also know from watching the United States over the last four years that Washington's politics can sometimes change abruptly and that some administrations may not always view Africa as a priority or see Africa's growing importance as a political, economic, and commercial partner. African leaders recognize the need to be more strategic, more self riot and more integrated as a continent. We see these words from some leaders. They also know that they have choices and they can turn to other nations for political support, financial investments, and commercial relationships. In addition to their former colonial powers, China, India, Turkey, Russia, and the Gulf Arab states have also shown substantial interest in Africa over the last decade. And African governments are eager to benefit from their commercial and financial ties with those nations. Although Africa has multiple options in its relations with the outside world, African leaders will have to address, I believe, five fundamental and existential challenges, both new and old, that stand in the way of sustained and long-term progress. These are challenges that Africa must meet. The first is population growth, that is driving Africa's youth bulge. Africa has the world's youngest and fastest growing population, and it is in the process of a major demographic transformation. Over the next 30 years, the population will surge from just over 1 billion to approximately 2.3 billion people swelling the ranks of young people across the continent. Today, 65% of Africa's 1 billion people are under the age of 35, and over 35% are between the ages of 15 and 35, making it the largest share of the world's working age youth population. Nigeria and Ethiopia reflect what is happening. In Nigeria, the population will roughly increase from today's 205 million people to well over 400 million, a total that will overtake the United States by 2050, making Nigeria the third largest country in the world after India and China. And in Ethiopia, the current population of just over 100 million will almost double by 2050. Similar growth is occurring in other countries around the continent, swelling the ranks of young Africans. African governments will have to focus on accommodating the needs and demands of their increasingly educated, media savvy, upwardly mobile, and globally, and I stress, globally connected young populations. If governments fail to create jobs, provide opportunities and improve social conditions, Africa's youth will take 
their grievances and resentments to the streets. We have seen this already as young Africans inspired by the activism of Black Lives Matter and empowered by social media have challenged their governments across the continent. The recent street protests across Nigeria urging the government to disband SARS, a notorious police unit, are an example and an outgrowth of this unease among Africa's youth. A second major challenge is climate change. Climate change is already a major problem in Africa. And as it intensifies, it could derail some of the continent's important economic gains. Almost no African country will be spared. Several recent UN studies have concluded that, quote, no continent will be struck as severely by the impact of climate change as Africa. Given its geographical position, the continent will be particularly vulnerable due to its low levels of preparedness, its limited adaptive capacity, and its shortage of resources, end quote. Climate events in sub-Saharan Africa have already resulted in enormous devastation, loss of life, and humanitarian disasters. Over the past five years, there have been devastating cyclones along the Mozambican coast, Historic droughts have recurred in Ethiopia and Somalia. Record shattering water levels in Lake Victoria have caused flooding in places like Kampala and Khartoum. In West Africa, Freetown, Accra, Lome, and Lagos have all experienced unprecedented flooding from record breaking rains and rising sea levels. One quarter of Africa's population, one in four people, will be directly impacted by changes in weather over the next two decades. And Africa will have to take this much more seriously and make it a higher priority going forward. Climate change will increase food insecurity, exacerbate malnutrition, and leave populations vulnerable to more health problems. Climate change will also generate serious resource conflicts like the fighting in some parts of Northeastern and the Middle Belt in Nigeria. And it will incentivize outward migration, illegal outward migration. The effects of climate change will also increase state fragility unless it becomes a higher priority for African governments. Terrorism, and violent extremism present another challenge in a number of countries. In East Africa, Al-Shabaab remains a potent force in parts of Somalia and has been, as it, uh, on several occasions, able to unleash devastating terror attacks in Nairobi. In West Africa, Boko Haram in northeastern Nigeria has been able to extend its terror network into Western Cameroon and Southern Niger. And in the Sahel, several Al-Qaeda aff affiliated groups have destabilized Mali and Burkina Faso, increasing the fragility of both states and raising the specter that they may be able to stir up unrest in the Northern parts of Ghana, Togo and Benin, and perhaps even Ivory Coast all of which have sizable Muslim populations. The Sahel is suffering from security distress, poor governance, and extreme fragility. Recent attacks in northern Mozambique's impoverished and long neglected Cabo Delgado province all show, show how terrorism can spread across the continent especially when communities feel marginalized and neglected by state authorities and governments fail to deliver essential services to their most vulnerable citizens. The threat of terrorism will continue to be a challenge 
for a number of African countries. But none of these new challenges are insurmountable. But in order to deal with them effectively, Africa will have to place a much higher priority on the old challenge of promoting good governance and accountability. African states will have to strengthen their democratic institutions and provide better services and opportunities to their citizens, especially their younger ones. The desire for democratic governance remains strong across Africa. The most recent surveys by Afrobarometer, Africa's best public opinion and attitudinal research organization, report that close to 70% of Africans prefer democratic governance, and well over 50% believe in term limits for their executives. A strong majority also believe uh, that governments should be more accountable to their citizens. However, after two decades of progress, democratic growth in Africa has stalled and in some places retreated. In a growing number of countries, the next decade or two will be extremely challenging for democracy and representative government. Despite the popular thirst for democracy among Africa's citizens, a small group of states have never made a full transition to constitutional democracy. And a number of democratic leaning states are now moving rapidly in the wrong direction. And resistance is growing to further democratization among some dominant political parties and long serving political leaders. We already see elements of this in states like Tanzania, Rwanda, Gabon, Togo, Chad, Cameroon, and Guinea Conakry, to name a few. Elected officials must do a better job of listening and responding to their citizens. States that eschew democratic reforms, hold fraudulent elections, close political space, violate the rights of their citizens, and abandon term limits and constitutional norms will have difficulty dealing with the problems associated with managing climate change, rapid population growth, urbanization, and most importantly, the aspirational needs of their young and expanding populations. The final challenge focuses on the economy. And just as Africa needs good government and good governance, the continent will need to accelerate its economic growth and speed up the pace of its reforms. Since the early 2000s, Africa has witnessed an enormous economic expansion and has been home to a dozen of some of the fastest growing economies in the world. And certainly prior to the onset of COVID-19, more than a third of African states had reported growth of 5% or more for over a decade. Much of this growth has been fueled by improved business conditions, increased foreign investment, a rapidly expanding middle class, urbanization, and the adaption and utilization of digital technology. The recently approved African Continental Free Trade Agreement is another major and positive step forward. But with its population expected to double in the next 30 years and being home to the youngest labor force in the world, the youngest and the largest labor force in the world, African governments need to create thousands of new jobs every year. In order to do this, Africa will have to increase its manufacturing base, expand its regional and global trade, and continue to build out its road, rail, and harbor infrastructures. It will also have to expand its electrical grid and make inexpensive, accessible, and reliable electricity more readily 
available. These issues will have to be addressed for Africa to make the next major economic leap forward possible for the benefit of all of its citizens. In conclusion, all of these issues are in the hands of African leaders to manage and resolve successfully in the best long-term interest of their citizens. How they manage and navigate these issues will determine the success of their societies and their countries. While Africa's future is clearly in the hands of Africans, there is absolutely no reason, no reason why the United States cannot be a strong and committed partner in working alongside Africa's leaders and citizens to achieve what they believe is best for their nations. Going forward, the strength of America's future relationship should be built around, around a very strong proposition of friendship, partnership, mutual respect, and a commitment to work together for the benefit of our people and our societies collectively, African and American. I think the incoming Biden-Harris administration in Washington will, in my estimation, be trying to do that. I hope that African leaders will look beyond the aberration of the last four years in Washington and accept that there remains a deep well of bipartisan political support in the United States for stronger, deeper relations and partnerships with the continent of Africa. Thank you. Ambassador Johnny Carson, thank you so much indeed. It is that um, clarity of thought which um, clearly demonstrates just how much um, you've been at the heart of State Department policy making when it comes to um, uh, relations between the United States and Africa. And we thank you so much indeed for that um, incredible overview. And I neglected to say at the beginning, I'm sorry that everybody who wants to ask a question to Ambassador Carson can uh, just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen. Having said that, Johnny, that was so comprehensive and um, that you touched just about every issue and preempted, I think, um, a lot of questions, but we have nevertheless um, already been receiving those um, as you were speaking and some of these things you've already touched on. But let me just go, uh, first of all, and tell you what um, Nicola Brewer wants to know. Nicola Brewer, um, I think I'm right, it must be the Nicola Brewer, whom I know, who was former British High Commissioner to South Africa. And Nicola is um, saying, with President Trump's refusal to concede, he has lost the election significantly. Um, how far does this undermine messages about respecting democratic values that the Biden administration is likely to want to share with African partners and potential partners? Let me, yeah. I, thank you very much. And, and High Commissioner, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Uh, there is no doubt that, as I said in my remarks, that the last four years uh, have seen uh, an unprecedented domestic uh, assault on U.S. democratic institutions uh, and norms. When that happens uh, in the United States, uh, it in fact is seen uh, by the global community. It undermines our principles and values of democracy and allows our adversaries and our enemies, those of democracy uh, and uh, of the United States to uh, call uh, our values and our policies hypocritical. I think that uh, it is, uh, and what we've seen over the last four years uh, is I think an aberration and the uh, victory by uh, Pre Vice President-elect uh, Biden and his running mate, uh, Senator Kamala Harris is an indication 
uh, that uh, this period uh, is now over uh, and the commitment by the president to hold a democracy summit and to elevate democracy is an attempt uh, to demonstrate America's commitment to its fundamental democracy principles and norms. And I hope that uh, we will see that uh, going forward. But there's no doubt, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, our foreign policy begins at home and what we do at home has a reflection of how we act abroad. All right, we've got quite a few questions. I'm gonna start coming in with them, um, but I'm gonna take them one at a time. Terence Jagger, who I've met, um, no relation of Mick Jagger, but I think you were former head of Crown Agents, but now Terence is speaking in his capacity as trustee of Tree Aid Charity, which works in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. And he asked you, Johnny, I'm interested to know if Ambassador Carson thinks the United States will engage in Francophone Africa, which has serious security problems and is hugely affected by desertification and poverty. The United States, like the UK, largely focuses on Anglophone Africa, which is not the whole story. Um, uh, Africa is the entire story, and that story encompasses Anglophone Africa, Francophone uh, Africa, Lusophone uh, Africa, and those uh, small parts of Africa uh, that are a part of, uh, of the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, the United States, uh, when I was Assistant Secretary, uh, had uh, some 44 uh, embassies in the 48 states uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And many of the larger embassies were in Francophone African countries. The United States values and appreciates its relationship with Francophone uh, Africa and has continuously maintained uh, embassies in uh, places like the DRC, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Gabon, Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Ivory Coast, which has been one of the economic success stories over the last decade. So we are there and we continue to recognize the potential, or at least uh, I speak on the outside looking in, I'm not in government, but there is a concern about the growing uh, threat of terrorism, fragility, and instability across the Sahel and in Francophone Africa. Uh, we're there, uh, and we will remain there, and we will work with the governments and the international partners to do so. Right, thank you. And um, you did talk about um, China and Africa and, and the United States, and you said that in your experience, you know, African leaders don't want to antagonize either, but Anthony Johnson asks this question, can we expect the new US president to involve himself in helping to offset the influence of China in Africa and helping with economic development? Let me say, I think that if one were to look at the uh, record of the United States government over both Democratic and Republican administrations over uh, the last uh, 40 or 50 years, one would find that the United States uh, has been a strong uh, uh, and committed development partner uh, in Africa. It has been focused on uh, strengthening human capital, uh, working on issues of health care, and we have done a lot on AIDS, Ebola, and other uh, pandemics across Africa. We've helped set up the uh, the the. Uh, the African CDC, for example, which is based in, in Addis. The United States has been a strong supporter of uh, agricultural programs uh, across Africa. I've mentioned that the Obama administration and its food, uh, its, uh, its, its uh, agricultural programs feed the future were designed uh, to create that green revolution in, in Africa, speeding up agricultural uh, development. Uh, it has been a strong supporter of Power Africa to generate electrification, uh, both uh, using renewables as well as traditional fuels to, to, to do so. Uh, we have not been in the business of big uh, showy projects uh, like building uh, airports and railroads. Uh, and I think that uh, China has uh, clearly uh, been in that business. Anyone can see the 
the railroads and the airports that they have built, but that is only one aspect of development. The United States has been focused on building human capacity and capital on healthcare, agriculture, education, power, clean water, uh, and support for women and girls. And those are just as important to do. I've heard and been in meetings in Washington in and outside of government where African leaders have clearly said, we value and support the relationship that we have with the United States. It's an important relationship, uh, but don't uh, condemn us if we go someplace else to get support to do projects that you cannot do because of your laws and regulations and financing. And so I think we have to be much more balanced. What we do have to do with respect to China is be very clear to African nations, beware of falling into a Beijing, a Beijing uh, debt trap. Don't overextend yourself uh, with credit and loans that ultimately you cannot repay. Ultimately, you will have to pay a high political price for maintaining. Be clear about the kinds of agreements you sign in business. Let them be transparent. Let them be clear. Don't get into barter agreements. Uh, make them transparent. Make them as transparent as they would with a British or an American or a French company. We all have laws that prohibit corrupt practices. We don't know uh, that China does. In fact, they don't as far as we know. And we know that they're engaged in activities that can, in fact, uh, undermine uh, the strength of some African countries. So have a transparent and clear relationship and don't uh, over uh, indulge in loans uh, and grants that will, in fact, lead you into debt. Right. Thank you. Um, a question here, a preface with a compliment from Sean McCormick, former NSC Director for African Affairs. He says, first, let me thank you for your decades long commitment to communicating to wide and diverse audiences, the principles, values and policies of the United States government towards the African continent. We're all the better for your efforts and engagement, Johnny. So Sean um, says with that historical perspective in mind, he wonders if you could offer some thoughts on the degree to which American policy towards Africa has been influenced positively or negatively over the decades through engagement with former colonial powers. And what lesson you think the next US Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs should take away? I don't know, there are two questions there, I think, kind of related. So engagement with former colonial powers, the impact of that on US policy towards Africa. I suppose the UK and France are the two big ones. And what lessons for the next person who's um, head point person on African affairs? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Sean. I, I know Sean. Uh, and it's uh, thank you for the compliment. And I hope you are doing well. Uh, I think the, we've benefited uh, uh, by being able to uh, work with, uh, collaborate with, and take away understandings uh, that both uh, Britain, France, uh, and uh, Portugal have had with respect to their former uh, colonial uh, territories. Uh, some of that benefit has been useful uh, insight into what to do right. Some of it has been useful insight and how to avoid pitfalls and what to do wrong. So there have been good things uh, and there have been uh, bad things. I think one of the good things is to uh, understand the rich uh, history uh, and, and uh, background that uh, colonial powers have, but also to be distant from some of the things that the colonial powers did. I'll be the first to say uh, that uh, colonial, the colonial experience, wherever it was, was not a democratic experience. The colonial experience uh, was not one of developing uh, leaders uh, and countries and economies 
to be strong, viable, and independent. We have to recognize that. The United States had a colonial experience many years ago as well, and it broke off uh, because it felt disadvantaged by them. But one of the things that uh, is Im important uh, in all of this uh, is to listen, uh, to listen effectively uh, and well uh, to those uh, uh, leaders uh, and organizations uh, in Africa that represent uh, their people. And one of the positive things uh, that I take away from this is to listen a lot, listen a lot uh, before uh, one takes an action. We've got lots of questions coming in still, Johnny, so I'm going to go mm -hmm. on. Edward Clay, former British High Commissioner in Kenya, senior former senior British diplomat, and he says you and he were both in Kampala together during the tragedy of the Rwanda genocide in 1994. He says since then many people have taken up the expression coined by President Bill Clinton in a speech four years later in 98 in Kigali, never again. His question is this, have we made useful progress in preventing another such tragedy in Africa? This is a, a day of, uh, of old friendships. I do remember uh, <laughs> my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Clay, uh, High Commissioner Clay, not only uh, in Uganda, uh, but also Kenya uh, as well. And so I say hello to uh, Edward Clay. And I might also uh, remark on two other things very quickly. Uh, one uh, is that my first ambassadorial post uh, was uh, in Kampala, uh, Uganda. Um, and there were two high commissioners there at the time. Uh, Edward Clay's uh, predecessor uh, was Charles Cullimore. Uh, and the U.S. Embassy uh, for the entire three years that I spent in the entire three years that, uh, that I spent in, uh, in Kampala, were actually spent uh, in property uh, that was owned by the British government. The US <laughs> Embassy occupied a part of the British High Commission that was not used because our property had been taken uh, years before during the Amin years. Uh, so we're uh, thankful I am as a diplomat that the British uh, government and both, in both uh, Charles Cullimore and Edward Clay were, were, were very good. First of all, uh, on the situation about never again. Yes, uh, it was an enormous, enormous tragedy. In the United States, there have been uh, some very serious efforts made uh, to ensure uh, that there is early warning against potential genocide, not only in Africa, uh, but also around the, the world. Uh, the Obama administration during its first uh, term in office uh, set up a genocide prevention uh, 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 council that looked very seriously uh, at tracking situations uh, that looked as though they uh, were going to perhaps lead to mass murder uh, and genocide. The also a number of organization in the uh, Washington area also uh, participated uh, in programs uh, that were clearly designed to increase American awareness of potential uh, genocide activities. Uh, the uh, Holocaust Museum uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. spends a, a lot of time looking at genocide prevention activities, and certainly at the National Security Council staff during the Obama administration, uh, there was particularly uh, a strong effort to ensure uh, that we were positioned in the U.S. government to, uh, to do this. Uh, the uh, U.N. Uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, who was the Obama's uh, U.N. ambassador during the second term, but during the first term, uh, she worked on setting up this genocide uh, prevention uh, awareness uh, effort inside the administration to be able to uh, pinpoint possible 
uh, genocide activity. So there's a there's a better awareness of it now, and the U.S. does in fact try to take uh, action early. All right. Well, of course, um, one thing that um, the International Criminal Court was set up to do was under responsibility to protect was to ensure that there wasn't impunity for um, you know acts of genocide and war crimes and crimes against humanity. And El Mutoni Wanyeki is um, asking this question. Um, you didn't mention the executive order concerning two of Africa's most senior international justice practitioners at the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, which includes the uh, prosecutor, um, Fatou Ben Souda. So your thoughts on that, um, um, El Mutoni Wanyeki is asking. Well, let me, let me just say that I mentioned in my remarks that uh, the Trump administration has been uh, carrying on uh, an assault against uh, many of our democratic uh, principles at home. It's been carrying on an assault against uh, international uh, organizations. Uh, it has uh, acted uh, to, to pull out of the WHO. It, it, yeah. It's been very uh, uh, difficult working relationship with the WTO. It's pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And yes, uh, it has taken action uh, against uh, individuals associated uh, with the criminal uh, court. Uh, this is all a part of a America a first uh, agenda that was practiced by the Trump administration, which was an America alone agenda, uh, which uh, tended uh, to undermine and distance itself uh, from any uh, international organizations uh, which uh, were not seen to be uh, in line with the Trump administration's values and views. We've got more questions. Very, very quick one here. Anonymous attendee, mm -hmm. what's your major in college and which organization was your introduction to working with the federal government at an international level? Well, I, it, you, you, didn't, you didn't mention it, but I came out of college uh, and um, within uh, a week uh, or 10 days of leaving uh, college, I went into the Peace Corps for three yeah. years. And then uh, almost immediately with a little bit of a time in, in, in England, uh, went in directly into the Foreign Service. Yeah. So I've been uh, in the Foreign Service for a long time. Yeah, I know you were in Tanzania very early on too, weren't you, with your uh, yes. work? What was your major in college? Oh, my po politics and economics. Great, right, good. So quick answers on this one too, although it's a really important topic. Robert Berg says, given the high population growth that you mentioned and the youngest labor force in the world in Africa, should basic and vocational should basic uh, question is jumping here. Should basic and vocational education be the highest priority after national security? Education is the key to a strong labour force for economic growth and can also develop a strong civic ethos. So, basic and vocational education the highest priority after national security? Is that question? Uh, I think uh, basic education uh, is important, extremely important. Uh, and it should not be exclusive to one area or, or another. I think there should be a range of educational opportunities for individuals in Africa, just as they are in other places. I think there is a place uh, for trades and vocational and technical education, but I also think there's a uh, need for individuals to be trained as doctors and nurses and, uh, uh, and digital technologists as well. Uh, but I think education is extremely uh, important, uh, but uh, it, it's not the only thing that is out there that is important. I think uh, there have to be a range of things done at the, at the, at the, at the same time. Right, okay. And um, a question here from one of our board members at the Royal African Society, got to get it in, otherwise yeah. he will not speak to me again, is Boko Inyundo. He says, when do you anticipate President-elect Biden and or Vice President-elect Kamala Harris visiting Africa and Kenya specifically? He is Kenyan. That's just between ourselves, uh, Johnny. Um, he said, former Bar Bar Barack Obama delayed a trip to our promised land by several years after his inauguration. So, well, when he, 
Yeah, I have no idea. I have no insight and no idea when uh, either will travel to Africa. Uh, I will just note one thing, uh, it, and that is that uh, President uh, Trump has not visited Africa during his four years. And during the first Obama administration, President uh, Obama, Obama, if some will remember, traveled uh, to uh, Ghana uh, during the first six months of his uh, administration. Uh, he gave a very uh, uh, strong speech on democracy before the Ghanaian parliament uh, six months after he was uh, in, in office. Some may remember the most important line of that speech, Africa needs uh, more strong institutions, not more strong men. Uh, uh, that was uh, done uh, six months after he was uh, in office. Um, in his second term, he made multiple trips to, to, to Africa. And I note that uh, Secretary of State Clinton uh, in August of 2009 uh, made uh, a uh, visit to Africa 11 days, I think, six countries uh, during that 11-day uh, 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 trip. Uh, I would expect that, uh, that uh, we will see uh, significantly more and more impactful visits by uh, a Biden-Harris administration, but I don't know anything about uh, calendar and when they might travel. Well, he's not going anywhere at the moment, Joe Biden, is he, with his broken foot or fractured foot after he's playing with one of his uh, <laughs> So there we are. I should think he's staying put for a while. And then Reed Kramer says, what tips can you offer the next Assistant Secretary for Africa to keep Africa issues on the front burner for the Secretary of State and um, his staff on the seventh floor? That's Tony Blinken, of course, we know is going to be the new Secretary of State and at the State Department and also at the White House up to and including the president. And I just had a PS on that. Any tips as to who may be the next Assistant Secretary of State for Africa? I have, no, I, have, I have no idea on who is likely to be the next uh, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. I have absolutely no idea who that, uh, who that might uh, be. Uh, I would uh, encourage uh, that the new uh, Secretary of State uh, travel to Africa, uh, make the kind of commitment to engage on Africa uh, in the same manner uh, as Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, as Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, uh, and as Secretary of State uh, uh, John Kerry. Uh, when uh, I worked for Secretary Clinton, uh, she committed uh, to travel to Africa at least two times every year. And I think uh, that is, uh, should be in fact a, a minimum uh, for any uh, Secretary of, of State to be able uh, to uh, visit uh, Africa meet leaders uh, in their own uh, countries, uh, support uh, the uh, good governance and rule of law, democracy, meet with NGOs, meet with election officials, meet uh, with opposition uh, parliamentarians and politicians, and meet with civil society. I think those trips are enormously uh, valuable in building up friendships. I think it's also important to strengthen the relationship between Washington and the African Union uh, leadership, uh, both the rotating chair as well as the leader in, in Addis. And I think it's important uh, that uh, the Secretary of State uh, do uh, in Africa what is done traditionally in Europe and Asia. There are certain countries that need to be placed high on the agenda all the time in Africa. I think that the importance uh, of a South Africa, of a Nigeria, of a Kenya, of a Cote d'Ivoire, of a Senegal, of a Ghana, uh, all are critical um, uh, for a Secretary of State. And those, are, they, those should be a high, uh, high priority. And ensuring that uh, Africa also 
uh, receives uh, its share uh, of the development assistance uh, funding uh, that's required to uh, ensure that uh, policy and program uh, implementation moves smoothly. All right, just very quickly, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, links between Washington and the African Union. What about people to people? And in particular, I'm thinking here about the African-American people and links with people on the continent of Africa. I think we saw that a lot of people living in Africa were outraged by the killing of George Floyd. And then we saw the Black Lives Matter and so on and so forth. Do you think that one um, lasting impact of that is going to be perhaps a stronger ties between African Americans, of course, the most visible, uh, visible of the dias African diasporas in the world and the continent of Africa? One would hope so. Well, I, I, I think there are quite a few linkages already. I think that uh, the African diaspora uh, in the United States uh, is large and strong. There are large uh, communities from Nigeria, uh, from Ghana, uh, from Ethiopia, uh, in particular uh, across the United States, um, and they're active communities. I think that the, the Black Lives Matter movement and the killing of George Floyd demonstrates how interconnected globally we are uh, as societies. Uh, and I think that uh, the internet carried that uh, around the world. And the reaction in the United States because of our ability to protest and seek redress from government probably empowered other people around the world to say that we can stand up against our government authorities if they in fact do things that are wrong. Uh, I think that Black Lives Matter uh, has had an, an impact globally. Uh, I think Black communities uh, around the world are no longer willing uh, to accept uh, racism uh, in their societies and are prepared to stand up. And I think Black Lives Matter does in fact reach out uh, to communities around the globe. Uh, there is interconnectedness because of social media uh, and there is the ability to organize, to exchange views uh, on. And so, yes, I think there is a, is a global impact. Right, that's good. And we hope that it has an impact. It's a, a turning point in the United States itself. I'd like to welcome to the floor um, Dr. Nick Westcott, our wonderful director at the Royal African Society, and um, himself, in fact, a, a former senior British diplomat, having served as High Commissioner um, in Tanzania, for instance, and um, in Ghana, for instance, I meant to say, Nick. So, Nick, you've been listening to Johnny Carson's um, tour de force lecture and all the questions that have been asked you know what do you want to ask johnny and, and just perhaps um give us in a nutshell what you take away from this year's annual lecture thank you zainab yes uh, johnny there's a huge number of really good takeaways from that before we get there i have one question you and i used to spend a lot of time talking about the day-to-day -day problems of africa and these often are complex issues where the questions of practical interests and values all get a little muddy. So what would your reaction be? What do you think the US government should be doing about the situation in Ethiopia, where the government is saying it's undertaking a law enforcement uh, exercise and the Tigrayans say they are being repressed by an oppressive central government and a lot of people are fleeing into the neighboring countries. Uh, we don't know how many people have been killed but it's a serious risk of instability, not just in Ethiopia, but across the region. So, you know, there are competing issues, interests and values involved here. What would you suggest uh, the US position should be on this? I think that uh, the US should be more actively engaged uh, publicly, uh, and privately in Washington, in New York, Western Europe, in key capitals, uh, Brussels, London, uh, Berlin, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Paris, and also on the ground uh, in Addis uh, as well. I think that our public statements 
should be extremely clear and concise. Uh, and they should probably uh, be the following. Uh, this uh, battle uh, cannot uh, be won middle militarily. The solution to this is not to be found uh, in fighting. Uh, there must be a political solution here. Uh, two, there must be uh, an immediate uh, ceasefire and cessation of hostilities. And every effort should be made to pressurize the government and both sides to accept uh, such a solution. Third, uh, there should be immediate uh, humanitarian access uh, to uh, civilians. Fourth, there should be no civilian uh, targeting uh, and any uh, targeting of civilians by either side will be fully uh, investigated by a neutral body and those found to be engaged in killing and harming civilians uh, should in fact uh, be brought to justice and punished. Fifth, uh, there should be clear messages uh, to the neighboring states and to the government that this uh, has the potential becoming uh, a regional uh, conflict. Uh, when uh, a uh, state uh, is pushing out uh, large numbers of refugees from its state into another state because of an internal conflict, it is automatically an international crisis. When the uh, 100,000 Eritrean refugees who fled uh, the repression uh, in neighboring Eritrea can no longer receive humanitarian support, uh, they uh, become an international uh, issue. Each of the neighboring states should be encouraged not uh, to become uh, involved in this, not to allow their territories, their militaries, their air forces, their air bases, to be used in uh, this uh, conflict. Uh, and so those are just a, a few of the uh, initial messages. Those messages need to be made strong and publicly in Washington. They need to be made uh, in New York at the Security Council. Uh, they should uh, be made uh, in uh, Europe and we should be working in close coordination with our European partners and we should be saying this in Addis, uh, our assistant secretary or our principal deputy assistant secretary uh, should have been on an airplane in Addis making these points very clearly. I think Nick, you uh, recall and some don't that there were any number of times on issues related to the Congo uh, that I jumped on uh, an airplane with my French uh, and my British counterpart, uh, another Nick <laughs> at the time. Uh, and uh, we traveled uh, in circuit uh, around to uh, a number of countries together to clearly demonstrate uh, the commitment of a core group of nations to try to resolve this problem. Uh, we should, uh, we may not always be successful but we should always be caught trying. Thank you. I think that that un underlines a number of points um, that uh, I think came out from both your lecture and the discussion. Firstly, as you say, Africa's salvation is in Africans' own hands, yeah. but they can and look for helping hands to achieve that salvation. Mm -hmm. From our point of view, as the US, UK, Europe, the question is, whom should we best be supporting in these circumstances? Is it governments, sometimes civil society, sometimes uh, democratic institutions like uh, electoral commissions? Again, sometimes, and it varies from place to place. Um, but on, in terms of economic growth, there's a huge amount we can do. But African governments themselves are riding a tiger. They have to accelerate growth and take decisions that will accelerate growth if they're to meet the expectations of the growing, particularly youth population. And that requires both help building infrastructure and help with the human cap capabilities, as you said, and connecting Africa to the global economy 
and integrating its internal economy. And we, we could have spoke longer about the um, uh, CFTA as well. But the two main takeaways I take uh, from what you say is that values are coming back into US policy. And I think that would be good for everybody. Um, and thirdly, that there's a huge scope now for partnership with the US, uh, with all others engaged with Africa, obviously with the African partners, but also with uh, Western partners, whether they're former colonial powers or have no colonial history um, in the EU, but also you mentioned with China and perhaps with India uh, and with Gulf countries. Uh, and the US will be looking for those partnerships. And that I think is a really positive uh, takeaway because we do need to coordinate amongst ourselves to ensure that the best helping hands can be provided to Africa. But Johnny, that was a, a fantastic uh, tour de force and it's great to listen to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much indeed, Nick. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. So it just remains for me to um, thank, first of all, Ambassador Johnny Carson for his wonderful lecture. It really is, I think, have, has given everybody so much food for thought. And um, I, I make one prediction. You said you don't know who's going to be the new Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, but I just think the new Biden administration is inevitably going to be calling on you for your wisdom, insights and experience. That I'm sure will happen on Africa. Thank you to everybody who's been attending um, this lecture. Thank you to all the uh, marvellous team at the Royal African Society for putting together this event. And um, please do consider joining the Royal African Society. It's really a, a great organisation. You won't regret it. It will be an excellent decision. And um, if you don't want to join as a member, you can please also support us by um, going onto our website and making a small donation. Whatever it is will be absolutely welcome because of course, as you know, turbulent times and um, the Royal African Society is, um, has, is no exception in um, trying to weather the very difficult storms of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all very much indeed. Renewed gratitude to you, Johnny. And uh, from thank me, Badawi, Chair of the Royal African Society, thank you very much indeed. Have a good evening. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.